Good afternoon, FOSDEM. So, as I was introduced, um, I'll be talking today about the uh, status of ARM support in the Linux kernel. Of course, I could be talking about this topic for many, many hours. So, in just 50 minutes, I'll, I'll just be giving a, a, a very high level overview of what are the main changes that have been taking place since the last um, one or two years inside the Linux kernel to support uh, ARM platforms. So briefly, I work for Free Electrons, and the main reason I'm talking to you about this topic today is because we work um, under contract with Marvel, who is a, a maker of um, ARM SOCs that are uh, very common in um, network-attached storage devices. Uh, so we do for them the Armada 370 and Armada XP support inside the mainline Linux kernel. So those are two uh, new ARM SOCs, or relatively new ARM SOCs. And besides that, I also contribute to another project called Bielroot. So today, um, I'd like to share first uh, some background information about the ARM architecture and the Linux support for it. I'm not sure if um, the entire FOSDEM crowd is uh, very familiar uh, with how the ARM architecture uh, works or is organized and how it differs from the x86 architecture. Then I'm going to show uh, some of the issues that uh, the Linux support for ARM had inside the kernel and see the main changes, or at least what I see as being the main changes that occurred in the last uh, few years in the ARM uh, kernel support in Linux. And I'll show also uh, in more specifically what we've done to support the ARM 370 and XP SOCs to see what kind of work is needed to, make, to add inside the mainline Linux kernel um, uh, the support for new ARM processors. So first, um, to understand the ARM architecture, it's very important to understand how uh, the chips are uh, well designed and how it comes down to the, the board or the system that you have in your home or in your office or in your industrial application or whatever. So to make it simple, and I know there are some ARM employees in the room, um, to make it really simple, ARM, the company, uh, does not sell any chips. They design an architecture, so they define an instruction set, they define how a memory management unit works, they define how the interrupts are handled inside the CPU, and everything that's really inside the CPU, and that's, that's only a, a kind of specification. They describe, we will support this instruction, this instruction with this behavior, uh, the memory will behave this way and this way, and so on and so on. From this uh, definition, they implement ARM cores, so they do an implementation, typically in Verilog, of such uh, specification. And then they sell this Verilog code or some other derivative form of that to silicon vendors. So ARM is, ne is, not, go is not selling processors. It is selling a specific implementation of a given ARM core to a silicon vendor. So silicon vendors being companies like TI or Freescale or Marvel or Broadcom, or many, many other. They have hundreds of licenses. And what do silicon vendors do? They create a system on chip, so they take one specific ARM core, or sometimes several of them, and they combine them with uh, additional peripherals, um, simple peripherals like serial port controllers, network interfaces, graphic controllers. There, there has been just before a talk about 3D graphics acceleration. They can bring uh, peripherals like 3D graphics accelerators. They can add, I don't know, um, any other type of uh, input-output interface, uh, Ethernet, scan, um, RS-232, RS-485, and many other types of peripherals to make the system on chip specific to uh, a given market. So some um, silicon vendors do chips for the industrial market with lots of IOs. Uh, some other silicon vendors do chips for the multimedia industries with a lot of uh, video encoders, decoders, 3D accelerators, and so on. Some other silicon vendors will do chips for uh, the automotive industry, some other for different markets. So depending on the ARM core you choose, depending on the peripherals you add, you target the chip to a specific market. And then down the line, um, there is a board maker or a system maker that builds this system on chip because now it is a physical um, chip that you can actually buy. And it puts it on a PCB and integrates some other components around it to interface with the outside world, add additional components as needed. So it's really important to understand this uh, chain of, um, of elements in that 
takes place in every ARM system that you, that you buy because it's one of the reasons why the uh, support for the ARM architecture is seen as so complicated by, by many people. So if we take some examples of those uh, like four stages, and again, it's kind of a simplified, simplified vision of it. Um, so we have, I took the example of two different ARM architectures, ARM v6 and ARM v7. So those are two different instruction sets um, that offer some kind of backward uh, compatibility. But those are two different levels of architecture. So those are two specifications. And for the specific case on ARM v6, uh, ARM has uh, designed an ARM 1176 uh, uh, core. That's, again, just some design that has been bought by Broadcom, integrated into the uh, no popular BCM 2833 um, SOC, which is used in the Raspberry Pi board. So what Broadcom did is buy this core and put some additional peripherals around it and sell you the chip. So this includes the famous or infamous video core stuff, but many other peripherals as well. And there are below some other examples as well. From the ARM v7 architecture, uh, ARM designed both the Cortex-A8 and Cortex-A15 that provide different levels of um, performance, power consumption, and so on. But they, from the outside perspective, they behave the same. They implement the same instruction set. And uh, for example, TI uh, took the Cortex A8 to do the AIM 33.5x uh, SOCs that are used, for example, on the popular BeagleBone platform. Uh, Samsung took the Cortex A15 to design the Ex Exynos 5, which is used on the new um, development board called the Undale. Or, and there are even some other silicon vendors, and Marvel is one of them who decide um, to not buy the ARM core, but instead buy the right to re-implement a different ARM core that is compatible with the ARM v7 architecture. So for example, the uh, Armada XP SOC, on, on which I've been working for, for some months now, uses uh, the PG4B um, ARM core, which has been entirely re-implemented by Marvel. So depending on the, the um, chip you're using, it's either an ARM core that has been designed and written by ARM, or it may be uh, also written by the silicon vendor uh, himself. So this uh, means that there will be a very huge variety of um, silicon um, uh, um, system on chip, sorry, available on the market. Um, there will be for, there are already hundreds of licenses of ARM, and each of them do several families of, um, of SOCs. Um, if any of you have, have already tried to understand the entire family of SOCs, even inside a, silicon, in a single silicon vendor, and like try to understand all the SOCs that TI is selling or all the SOCs that Marvel is selling, they are so numerous that it's very compl complex to understand what SOC is designed for what markets, what features is in each SOC, and so on. So there's a huge variety, and that's kind of typical to the, kind of specific to this uh, ARM architecture. So it makes it really fun, but also means that, well, you need to handle this, this variety. So in a very high-level view, when you work and in, in, interact with um, an ARM uh, hardware platform, um, be it your phone, your TV, um, or your development board like the BeagleBone or the Raspberry Pi or any other ARM-based platform, um, it's very important to always have this vision of what you're using. So you're using a board that has several components on it, like some, some RAM, some flash, some Ethernet connectors, sometimes some additional, I don't know, uh, I2C thermometers or accelerometers or any other components. So those are the onboard peripherals in, in purple here in my, in my diagram. And of course, amongst those components that are visible on your PCB, one of them is probably the most important of all, it's the SOC. So it's one chip from the outside. You can only see just it's one chip with many um, pins that are usually below it. You, you, so you can't even see the pins. And this SOC, which in the case of Raspberry Pi comes from Broadcom, for example, integrates many peripherals inside it. So again, serial controllers, graphics controllers, Ethernet controllers, and many other things, and an ARM core. So that's really the design that you have. And then the Linux kernel needs to handle do all those levels of um, uh, different hardware uh, components. It needs to handle the ARM core. It needs to handle the uh, peripherals inside the SOC and the peripherals that are on the board. And of course, do that by sharing as much code as possible because we don't want to duplicate uh, code in the kernel.
Another aspect of the ARM architecture is that, well, I said no standardization, but I should have said not too much standardization. It's kind of part of the ARM philosophy, or at least my understanding of the ARM philosophy, to leave a lot of freedom to the SOC vendors. So ARM sells the ARM core, but then leaves basically complete freedom to the SOC vendors to integrate the peripherals in their SOC. So they don't say you should use this bus or organize the peripherals this way or use this sort of peripherals, something like that. They just give them almost total freedom. So that's, that's nice because silicon vendors come up with uh, interesting ideas. They go in various directions. They can uh, maybe um, fill the needs of various markets by integrating various types of peripherals, uh, providing various um, uh, well, um, solutions in terms of cost, performance, pore consumption, and so on. So it's pretty nice. Um, but it also means that from a software perspective, each SOC is different, and you need to write some code for each SOC to support the different peripherals. Uh, so there's no standard for the devices, for the management of clocks, for the management of pin muxing, for the management of archi controllers, of timers, even though it's some of those things are getting standardized as, as we go in, in the new generations of ARM cores. It's still quite free uh, for the uh, silicon vendors. So when you take an, a Marvel SOC and a TI SOC and a Broadcom SOC, the way you configure the clocks, the pin muxing, uh, the ARC controllers is entirely different. Um, and so that's one part of it. And the other part of it is that contrary to what's no common on the x86 architecture, there is no mechanism to enumerate the devices available inside the system on chip. So on x86, typically, most of the devices sit on the PCI bus, and the PCI bus provides a dynamic enumeration capability. So you can ask your PCI controller, hey, what's on the bus? And it's going to tell you, oh, on slot zero, you have this thing that's a graphics controller for MMDDR with this identifier, and so on and so on. In slot one, you have this Ethernet controller from Intel, and so on and so on. Inside the ARM SOC, Nothing like that. There is no enumeration mechanism. You have to know in advance that at this specific address sits this special specific peripheral, at this other address there is this other peripheral, and so on and so on and so on. So it's, again, a lot of information that the software needs to know and to be able to run on, on such platforms. So now that I've given this um, uh, background about the ARM um, hardware, uh, let's look a little bit um, at how it's supported inside the Linux kernel originally. So that's why I'm, I'm putting all the here and I'm going to explain some of the details, some of the changes, sorry, that have been brought to this organization. So in the Linux kernel, um, of course, most of the code is architecture independent and I'm, I'm not going to be too much interested um, during this talk by the architecture independent uh, parts of the kernel. So I'm going to be focused in, on the Arch ARM directory, which as you might guess, contains all the ARM specific code. And inside this directory, we, have, we could classify things in, in two big areas. Uh, we have the parts that we could call the core ARM kernel, the things that take care of the ARM core itself, so that knows uh, how to configure the MMU, how to um, manage the, uh, the interrupts, how to boot the system, and really the things that are core and not specific to the peripherals of a given SOC. So this part is, I would say, relatively um, small in, in size, well, at least it, it doesn't grow um, too much because there is, it's specific to the, the ARM core itself. So it's common to all the SOCs that exist. It's pretty well maintained. ARM um, themselves, the company, and, and their engineers do a lot of work in, in uh, bringing that uh, constantly up to date with the new ARM cores that are being released. So it's pretty well maintained, relatively small compared to, to the rest. Uh, so that's what we have in Arch Arm, Canal, Arch Arm, MM, Arch Arm, MM, um, Arch, Arch Arm, Boot, and so on. And then next to that, we have a lot of SOC specific code because, as I've said, you need, we need to support the differences of uh, all the SOCs that are supported by Linux. And this is done in the uh, Linux kernel through the Arch R Mac something. Um, so you have one for, um, I don't know, the IMX from Freescale, one for the OMAP from uh, GI, another one for the um, S3C chips from Samsung, and, and so on and so on. And are currently probably some, somewhere between 50 and, and, and 100, maybe 50, 60 uh, directories uh, with this name, uh, each taking care of a specific SOC or families, uh, family of, S of SOCs. 
So inside this, these directories, we typically add all the SOC-specific code, ending the clocks, the pin muxing, um, registering all the devices that are present inside this system on chip. Like, okay, on this system on chip, there are four serial port controllers at this address, this address, this address. On this other variant of almost the same SOC, but not, not exactly, there are only three serial port controllers, but there are two network interfaces. And this other one, there are two serial ports, but four network interfaces, and so on and so on. So on all, all this, this good description of the hardware. And then in addition to that, uh, those directories typically contain what people familiarly call board files. Um, that's a C file that describes a particular hardware platform. So if we go back here, so we typically have one directory for each of the SOC families. So we would have one for uh, BCM2835, we have one for the OMAP platforms, we have one for the Exynos platform, another one for the Marvel platforms. And then inside those directories, we would have add one um, uh, board file for each specific hardware platform that you have. So here I only illustrate uh, with one board for each SOC, but of course you can imagine with that many people are buying like, um, I don't know, the GIAM uh, 33X, 5X chip and develop and, and produce many, many different hardware platforms. So I don't know how many board files uh, did exist in the Linux kernel, but um, several hundreds of them. So it's a lot of C code, uh, pretty boring. Um, hard to maintain and so on. And the other part of the, um, of course, very important part of uh, the uh, support for hardware are drivers. So the device drivers in Linux are mostly architecture independent, so they sit not in the Arch directory, but in drivers. And that's going to be quite important because, as we'll see, one of the, uh, the change that occurred is trying to move more things into um, driver uh, subsystem and therefore in the driver's directory. So what was the issue, or at least my understanding of the issues? Uh, again, as, as you've seen, I'm, I'm just mostly involved in, in bringing into mainline the support for uh, two Marvel SOCs, so I don't necessarily have a, a big vision of everything that's happening in the ARM kernel world, so it's my vision of what has been happening. But essentially, in the recent years, the number of uh, ARM SOCs has literally exploded. Um, must basically know everybody has ARM SOCs around that can run uh, Linux. And those SOCs have become more and more complex. So it's not only the number, but also the complexity of those SOCs that has increased quite a lot. And the historical maintainer of the ARM architecture, uh, Russell King, uh, got more or less overflowed by the amount of code that, um, that is specific to each and every SOC uh, that needs to be reviewed before being brought into mainline. And because he couldn't review uh, this huge amount of code, and, and it's really difficult because it's specific to each SOC, you have to know the specific details of uh, this SOC from this vendor, from this other vendor, and so on. So it's quite complex. Um, so basically what um, started to happen is that the sub-architecture maintainers, so what we call sub-architecture, uh, um, are the um, uh, families of SOCs. So basically in the ARM community at the kernel level, you have um, a small community around the OMAP platform, a small community around the Marvel platform, a small community around the, um, I don't know, uh, Broadcom platform, a small community, and so on and so on, specialized around one SOC or a family of SOCs. And so those communities, it, usually each of them have a, a top maintainer, they started to send the, their code directly to Linux, uh, basically bypassing Russell, who couldn't handle the load of uh, reviewing all this code. So it allowed the, the code to flow um, into the kernel, but the problem is that nobody was then at that this point um, having a cross view of the different sub-architecture. So nobody was here to detect um, um, duplicated code or, or common patterns that were not being solved by a common infrastructure and things like that. So it was really lacking of a maintainer looking after all those SOC families. So code duplication and more importantly, missing common infrastructures leading to some maintainability problems and so on. And this problem that um, um, was, became well more well known uh, to, uh, to the uh, entire, uh, I would say, open source crowd um, in, in March 2011 when Linus said, okay, uh, this all arm thing is a mm, pain in the ass. Um, 
you need to do something about it. So it's kind of the, the starting point. Well, it, it started a bit earlier, but it was kind of accelerated the, the, uh, um, the need to move and make a few changes to uh, the, um, and how the ARM architecture is, is managed in the Linux kernel. And the other issue, or I'm not sure it was an issue, but um, uh, a need, a new need that appeared is the need for multi-platform kernel. So on x86, um, it's um, pretty conventional, or everybody is used to building a single kernel image that boots basically on old PCs that exist. So provided, of course, you have the right drivers, you can build one kernel, ship it as the official kernel for your um, FUBAR distribution, Ubuntu or um, uh, Fedora, or whatever your favorite distribution is. You build one kernel, you ship it, and you know it's going to boot on all laptops, all desktops, all servers, and so on and so on. So it's one image fits all. That's pretty good for, for distributions. On ARM, that's typically, or that was typically impossible. So you could uh, build a kernel that would boot on different boards that use the same SOC, so the same processor, but it was absolutely impossible to build a single kernel that would boot on a Nomad platform and a Marvel platform. Totally impossible. So if you, have a, if you are a distribution maker or a system maker and you want to sell or provide a system that will easily boot on ARM-based tablets or ARM-based laptops or ARM-based netbooks or whatever type of hardware you care about, basically you had to build one kernel per hardware platform you wanted to support or family of hardware platforms you wanted to support. So it's kind of annoying. And if you've looked at the Ubuntu support for ARM, for example, they have different images or different kernels uh, depending on the, uh, the hardware on which you're going to run this distribution precisely because of this problem. So it's not nice, and as ARM SOCs are no longer being used only in deeply embedded applications where you don't really care about distributions, but are now also being used in more uh, consumer, um, uh, well, devices where you want to allow people to change their system, update it, add more applications, and so on, it started to become a problem. And so one of the issues to solve was how to add uh, multi-platform support to the uh, ARM Linux kernel. Uh, which means how can we build a single kernel image that will boot on as many SOCs as possible and therefore support as many hardware platforms as possible. So basically, those are, I would say, the two main issues. There are probably many more that I've, I'm not aware of, but I think that's the, that's the main two ones. So now let's look at the changes that uh, took place in the uh, ARM community. Uh, the first change, and I don't know if it's the most important one or not, but certainly an, an, an important one is the change of maintenance process. So as I was saying, the sub-architecture maintainer were uh, uh, pushing their code directly to Linux, and um, this has changed. Now we have a team of uh, two ARM SOC maintainers. So Arne Bergman works for Linaro now, we used to work for IBM, and Olaf Johansson, who as far as I know works for Google, and those two guys, they take care of taking all the ARM SOC specific code from the different sub-architecture maintainers. So know the OMAP maintainer, the Marvel maintainer, the Broadcom maintainer, and so on and so on. They push their code to Arn and Olaf, and they do a review. Well, it, the, the review process happens before that, but basically they take care of having this cross SOC view, trying to identify where things should be done, are, are kind of similar between different SOCs. Maybe we need to find a common solution for them. Maybe we need to create a new subsystem that will solve this specific problem and so on. And it, I, uh, at least from the contribution I've done on the um, uh, Marvel SOCs, I, I see it work pretty nicely. I mean, Arn and Olaf uh, review a lot of patches. They do a lot of comments, uh, try to point um, similarities with other uh, families of SOCs or and, and so on. So it's works pretty nicely. At, at the moment, for example, I, I'm working on, on the PCI support for those Marvel SOCs, and I work very closely with um, um, the guy doing the PCI support for the Tegra SOCs from NVIDIA. So we look at each other's code, trying to find common patterns, sharing infrastructure, and so on, making drivers more similar. So it, I, I, f I see it working. So that's one change. Now all the code flows uh, into an, a tree, a Git tree called ARM SOC. Uh, where all the conflicts are resolved, all the ARM-specific discussion happens, and this ARM SOC 
tree is then merged uh, upstream uh, by Linus. So we now again have um, uh, this uh, cross SOC view. And um, in this um, team of maintainers and generally in, in the different other changes that we've seen, there is a fairly important role of a consortium called Linaro. It's a consortium that um, uh, into which uh, many um, ARM silicon vendors participate, probably not enough, certainly, but some SOC vendors. So ARM and themselves, but I think also TI. Uh, I don't want to give wrong names, but I think Samsung as well, and, 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 and some others. They put engineering resources into this consortium. And instead of being only focused on getting the support for their own SOC into mainline, they care about the, the bigger picture, how to make the kernel itself better to support the ARM architecture. So they try to design new subsystems and so on. And I'm going to present uh, some of those. So this consortium has played a quite important role in, in those, uh, those changes. So that, that was about the first change. The second important change, and probably the one that is going to be visible to um, most of the people, because it doesn't only affect uh, the kernel developers, but even the users of the kernel, is the introduction of the device tree in the ARM architecture. So, as I was saying, uh, the device is inside an SOC and most of the time on the board, so outside the SOC but on the PCB, are, cannot usually be enumerated. So you have to know in advance uh, which devices will be there, on which bus, how to configure those devices, at which address, and so on. And the old way of doing this description was using C code. Uh, so a lot of this SOC specific code and board specific code that I was referring to earlier was here to register what uh, is called in, in the, um, the kernel terminology platform devices. So those are devices and the, the kernel has a, a nice uh, uniform device model to represent all the devices in your system, be they uh, USB devices, i 4 c devices, um, USB, PCI, and so on. And one specific type of devices are the platform devices. Those are the ones that are directly within the platform itself, uh, like the, uh, the peripherals that are inside the SOC. So typically, a lot of code was looking like this thing. Uh, at some point in the kernel initialization, once we had detected the board on which we were running, what is the SOC, uh, we would register many, many uh, peripherals this way. So here we're registering the um, uh, USB uh, device controller of an 8091 um, SOC from Atmel. So basically, we have a lot of C code that says, OK, in this platform, I have an, a um, USB device controller. The driver is identified by this name. So actually, the, the string here is very important because that's this string that allows us to associate the device with the corresponding device driver. And this device is located at this address. Uh, that's the uh, RQ. I think my laser pointer is dying. Too bad. Um, so here we have the base address and here the RQ. And those informations are communicated to the device driver, which then knows, OK, there is one USB gadget controller on this platform of this type at this address at this RQ. So we had a lot of this kind of boilerplate um, type of C code. Uh, it was working, but main, apparently um, it was seen as not being really nice to maintain. Uh, so the ARM community has moved towards a different description of the hardware um, using a specialized language called the device tree. That's uh, a solution that has been used since many, many years on PowerPC and is also used in other architectures inside the kernel like Microblaze, of course, the new ARM64 architecture, uh, the extensor architecture, OpenRISC, and maybe others in the future as well. So basically, instead of doing C code, you describe your hardware uh, with a specialized language that looks like a tree, hence the name. So here I took uh, a short extract of the um, device tree that represents the um, uh, BCM2835 SOC. So in, that's the SOC inside the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the kernel support for this hardware is very, very minimal, so that's why there are not many peripherals here. But basically, I won't detail the entire language, but what we describe is in this uh, SOC, we have one device that is an interrupt controller that sits at this address, and the string here identifies the driver that corresponds to this device. We have a UR controller 
with strings, again, identifying the driver that will be responsible for managing this device, the interrupts, um, the registers, and so on and so on. So we describe what's inside your hardware, basically. And um, this file describing the SOC, so the chip, gets inherited by a file describing the board. So this one describes the Raspberry Pi itself. And at the moment I made the slides, uh, only the UART was supported, so it's uh, pretty easy. So here we say, okay, my board uses a BCM2835 uh, SOC, so I inherit from that. And I overlay um, on the previous tree, I overlay this one. So basically, I add um, um, an information about the amount of memory in this system. And here, I override the property status. So you see here, status was disabled uh, to say, OK, there's a new UART controller, but it's not used. And here, we say, oh, in this board, this UART controller is actually wired to the outside world. And so we want to enable it. And from these two files, and there is a compiler called the device tree compiler which is part of the kernel sources, uh, that will produce at compile time a binary representation of this uh, device tree. That's called a device tree blob for DTB. And this uh, DTB will be passed uh, to uh, the kernel by the bootloader. The kernel will parse it and find there the description of the hardware and therefore be able to instantiate all the available devices. So essentially, it's a bit more complex than that, but essentially we're, re we're replacing a C-based description of the hardware by a more um, um, a specialized language uh, description of the hardware called the device tree. So if we look at, um, I'm going to jump here and be back uh, on the previous slide after that. So in the old style way of before the device tree, uh, on ARM you would be building a kernel that includes uh, as C code uh, the description of all the uh, peripherals on, inside the SOC and uh, on the board. And the kernel would know on, on it, which platform it gets booted thanks to a, an identifier called the machine ID that gets passed by the bootloader. So if you could build a kernel that supports multiple boards as long as they use the same SOC, and the bootloader will tell the kernel, oh, you're being booted on the Raspberry Pi, you're being booted on, on this or this platform. And then the kernel would know, okay, I'm on the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to instantiate this and this and this and that. Now the hardware description is kind of outside of the kernel in this device, device tree blob. So when you boot your ARM, ARM kernel from your bootloader, you actually need to load two files in memory and, and um, give, uh, give them to the kernel. So the kernel image itself, which no longer includes the description of the hardware, it of course includes device drivers, but not the description for a specific hardware platform of which devices are present and where and, and how they are connected and so on, only the device drivers. And then next to that, you load into memory a device tree blob, and then you boot your kernel. And when you boot your kernel, you tell it where is the device tree blob, it will parse it and find the available hardware. So we separate out the hardware description, basically. Um, there is for, uh, for those using um, some of the old platforms, uh, they are, there is a compatibility mode because the, this solution requires support from the bootloader. Your bootloader has to know about the device tree and be able to load it into memory. Sometimes bootloader even need to make changes to the, um, to the device tree to adjust some parameters like say uh, the MAC address of your network interfaces or some other properties. Uh, but there are many bootloaders around that uh, still don't have um, um, device tree support, and for those, uh, the kernel is capable of being built with a device tree blob integrated into it. A bit like you would build it with a firmware integrated into it, you build it with device tree integrated into it, and from the point of view of your bootloader, it's still just a kernel image, just one file as it used to be, but from the point of view of the kernel itself, it really just parses a device tree blob like it would do in the normal case. So it's one of the big change and uh, progressively, so all of the new platforms in the Linux kernel have to use the device tree. So all the new ARM platforms need to use the device tree, so you, otherwise you can't get in. And all of the existing popular platforms are being migrated. So OMAP things, uh, Marvel things, uh, many uh, existing SOCs are being converted over to the device tree. And as you can see here, it's 
it has an impact not only at the developer level, but also at the user level. And um, this, as I've shown on the, um, on the example of the um, Raspberry Pi, uh, there is inheritance that takes place. So you write, uh, in the case of the Raspberry Pi, one device tree that describes the SOC, and then another that describes the board and inherits from the, uh, the SOC, but adds some more board-specific information. And this inheritance is actually quite practical when you have a family of SOCs that have, where you have multiple types of processors that have some commonalities, but also some differences. And that's uh, the case in the Armada 370 and XP SOCs that we're taking care of. So that's a family of SOCs. We have the Armada 370, that's one chip you can buy. But the Armada XP is actually three different SOCs. Some of them have two cores, some of them have four cores, some of them have like uh, four PCI interfaces, some of them have, have 10 PCI interfaces, so it's quite um, um, complex. But thanks to the device tree organization, we can uh, factorize the common parts um, in, in the description of the hardware and then put the more specific parts into different files. So here you see, for example, if you're using the OpenBlocks platform, it's a nice small box that uses the um, uh, 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 two cores variant of the Armada XP called the uh, 78260. So it inherits, this board inherits from the 260, which itself inherits from the Armada XP, which inherits from Armada 370 XP. And those different device tree add more hardware description until we reach an entire description of the hardware when we come at the board level. So it, it's, it's quite nice. So that's uh, the second change I add. The third change, which I think I already mostly said everything about it, the need for a multi-platform kernel. You want to build a single kernel that can, kernel image that can boot on um, as many platforms as possible. So the, the device tree is one part of the answer to this, but it's only a fairly small part of it. If you put the hardware description outside of the kernel, then you can pass different hardware description and have the kernel adapt to, to it, but it's not the only problem that had to be solved. Um, there, there was a lot of conditional, uh, conditional code inside the kernel that is at compile time. You would decide, do I integrate the support for this SOC or that one? But you couldn't have both at the same time, so you need to replace a lot of um, conditional at compile time by conditional at runtime run to detect, okay, I, I'm on the, at this SOC or this board and at runtime decide what to do. Um, there were also conflicting APIs like uh, if you build the kernel for OMAP, it would implement a function foobar, and if you build the kernel for Mavel, it would implement the same function called foobar. So of course, if you build one with just OMAP or one with just Marvel, it, play, it works fine. But if you build the kernel that has both together, you have conflicting symbols. So all those kind of things needed to be sorted out. And now it starts to be possible, I think since 3.7, to build a single kernel image that builds on different platforms. Of course, not all of the ARM platforms have support this capability, but the new ones uh, do. So it's kind of the device tree. If you want to add the support for a new SOC in the Linux kernel, it has to support uh, this mechanism. So basically, it is possible to build one kernel that will boot on all ARMv4, ARMv5 SOCs, and a different kernel image for MV6, MV7. So it's not possible to do one that does everything, but it's can with two kernel images you would uh, solve the problem for um, um, most of the uh, the ARM platforms around. So that's another change that um, is taking place. And again, as I said, since 3.7, it's uh, it's live and actually works. Another change um, is the introduction of the pin control subsystem. Um, time is passing. Um, so basically, in these ARM SOCs, uh, you have so many peripherals inside that you don't have enough pins on the, the processor itself to use all the peripherals that are inside the, the chip. So you need to decide, and that's configurable by software, uh, to what functionality each pin of the SOC will uh, correspond. So here I have chosen some example. Let's say you have um, UR controller, SPI controller, and I2C controller, and you have uh, two pins. Um, well, of course, you can't make use of all these features at once. You have to decide, I want to use either the UR or the SPI controller or the I2C or use those pins as normal GPIOs. So that's software configurable. So if it's software configurable, we need code inside the kernel to do that. 
And in the, I would say, old kernel, basically each ARM sub-architecture was solving this problem in its own way. So each sub-architecture has its own API, its own way of describing the pins, its own way of doing this configuration. So lots of code duplication. Each device driver had to somewhat describe which pins it required in an API that wasn't the same depending on the SOC you were using, so not nice. So there was a lot of code in Arch ARM and no um, factorization happening. So one of the things that happened, and it's uh, mainly being driven by um, Linus Wallage, uh, who works also for uh, in, in, inside the Linaro consortium, so when I said they played an important role here, that's one example. He designed a pin control subsystem, so that sits in driver's pin control, so that's moving stuff outside of Arch Arm into proper drivers. And this um, subsystem uh, allows the implementation of um, uh, pin maxing drivers, so those are the yellow boxes at the top left. Uh, so for each SOC, you implement a driver that describes, I have those pins, and how I change the configuration between pins. And then, um, the device tree can define um, the possible configurations of pins. So for example, in my case here, I would say in my device tree, uh, if you want to use UR3, then you have to configure pin 1 and pin 2 in such or such mode. And then in the board file, you would say, on this board, I make the choice of using UR3. So I won't be able to use SPI1 and I2C0 because the pins are already used by some other um, device. So it very nicely uh, splits the uh, configuration of the, um, the pins, how to actually change, change it and modify the registers from the description of the hardware. So it's a quite complex subsystem, but here the idea is that by moving things outside of Arch Arm into a proper subsystem, we factorize more things, um, more code, and we also look at the other drivers doing pin muxing. So we find common patterns, we factorize them out, and so on. So it, <coughs> it's really a, a good improvement, <coughs> this pin control subsystem. On more or less the same idea, the clocks. So in a system on chips, all the peripherals are driven by one or more clocks. And those clocks are organized in a tree, and many of them are software controllable. So for example, to save power, you can gate certain clocks, or you can change their frequency to, well, reduce the power consumption. So since they are software con controllable, you need, well, code to manage them. And until now, uh, the only um, mechanism in the kernel to do that, or at least at the ARM level, was an API. So the device drivers could do a, get a clock, enable a clock, disable a clock, and put a clock, but that was just an API. And each ARM sub-architecture had its own implementation of this API. So OMAP had its implementation of CLK gets, uh, CLK enable, CLK disable, CLK put, and so, so on with other functions. And the other SOC families had their own implementation as well. So first of all, the obvious problem is that it does not work at all for multi-platform kernel because you have multiple implementation of a function that has the same name. So obviously, if you compile and link them together in the same kernel image, boom, it does not even link. Uh, but further than that, it does not allow code sharing, uh, have common mechanisms, and so on. So a common clock framework was um, added in the kernel in 3.4 and device tree bindings for it. So mechanisms to use it from the device tree were added in 3.6. So it's pretty recent. Basically what this framework does is it provides a single implementation of this API, which basically for the driver hasn't changed that much, except a few details. So drivers uh, can still get the clock, enable it, disable it, and um, do various things around the clock. But besides, um, be beyond that, there is one single implementation of it, uh, the common clock framework, and each SOC family needs to bring its own uh, clock drivers. So for example, on OMAP, you have a certain number of clocks that are configured through special registers. There is one or several drivers to manage them. And there are also um, basic clock drivers that are available for simple clocks that you can just enable, disable, or uh, simple divider clocks or fixed factor clocks and so on. So it really allows to factorize code um, for the management of those um, things. And again, all this code was originally in Arch ARM, specific to each SOC family. 
and is being migrated in drivers slash CLK. So it's not only about moving code, but by moving code into a common directory, you also uh, encourage developers at looking at the other clock drivers and finding commonalities, reusing existing patterns, and so on. So sometimes people don't really see that just as moving code, but it's, I, I believe, uh, really an, an encouragement in looking at the other drivers that's there. So it happens for pin control, it happens for clock, and it's going to happen for more things. And then this uh, co common clock framework allows in the device tree to declare the clocks that you have. So you, it's actually describing your hardware, what's your tree of clocks, and then associate in your device tree each device with the relevant clocks. So then your device driver can just do, I want my clock, and then it's described in the device tree, oh, but the clock of this uh, device is this one, which requires this one and this one and this one, and it will automatically take care of enabling the right clocks. So it's pretty pretty nice um, system. So it's summarized here, the clock framework. On one side, you have the device drivers, like your Ethernet controller driver, your signal port controller driver, your i 2 c controller driver. Uh, each of those drivers are driving a specific device that needs one or several clocks. So they use the clock get, clock put, clock disable, clock enable API provided by the clock framework. As an input, it gets the device tree, which tells the clock framework what clocks are available, their name, and the association between devices and clocks. And then behind, uh, without the device drivers knowing about that, uh, it uh, um, talks to different clock drivers that are either specific to your SOC or more, uh, more generic. And that solves the problems nicely and also isolates the device drivers from the specificities of your SOCs. If I go back to the beginning here, these uh, green boxes, they could be the same between different SOCs of different vendors. Um, typically, the discussion about the um, uh, 3D acceleration, you, can, you see that um, the power VR core is used on uh, Texas Instruments chips, but also on others. But it's the same for some USB device controller and on, on other things. So a, a, um, a peripherals is not, is not necessarily specific to an SOC, and there is some reuse at the hardware level between SOC vendors. So you want for those peripherals to have a single device driver in the kernel. And to make it possible, you need to kind of make the device driver itself independent from how this peripheral is inside the system on chip. So you need to separate the pin muxing thing, uh, separate the clock thing to make the device driver re reusable between uh, different SOCs using the same peripheral. Another change, which I think I've been highlighting already, um, is the move of uh, code from Arch ARM into drivers. So as I said, it's not only about moving code just to make the amount of code reduce in Arch ARM and have more stuff in drivers, but it's also that by uh, categorizing drivers by type, you will have more developers looking at the different drivers of the same type and finding commonalities and, and helping maintenance and so on. So the RQ controller drivers are moving in drivers RQ chip. The timer drivers are moving in drivers clock source. The PCI host controller drivers are moving in drivers PCI host. The clock drivers are moving in drivers CLK, PinMax, the same thing, it's, it's moving over. Um, so that will make things um, um, nicer in, in the future and reduces the amount of code in, in Arch ARM. So to finish, just to illustrate uh, the work we've done on the Armada 370 and XP, it's going to be pretty quick here, um, to show the progression of work we did. We started uh, with Linux 3.6 uh, by adding the basic support for those uh, SOCs. So when I say basic, it's really basic. You could simply boot have something on the serial line um, no storage driver at all. Everything had to be uh, with a RAM file system, and that's all. So we had just a minimal device tree, uh, basic initialization, C file, a timer driver, RQ controller driver, um, support for uh, early print K, which gives you messages when the kernel is, is booting very early, and a serial port driver. But in fact, for serial port, we had nothing to do because it, this as particular SOCs use the 8250 um, UART compatible um, uh, peripherals. So with just 10 patches, we had the beginning. It went in 3.6. In 3.7, we added more um, um, basic infrastructure, the pin control driver, the GPIO driver, and some specific 
stuff to Marvel as some things that we call the address decoding code that allows to configure physical addresses. Well, it's kind of complicated. So we had 35 patches to put that in place. Then 3.8 was quite big for, uh, for us. Um, we added uh, L2 cache support, uh, the clock drivers and clock tree description, as I said, uh, the SMP support, coherency support, so it allows when you have multiple um, CPUs to make sure that they share the same view, but also between the CPUs and the IOs. We added a network driver that was completely new, and then we um, enabled SATA um, support and XOR support, and those were pretty easy because Marvel reused um, the same IP blocks as earlier versions of their SOCs, and they were existing drivers in the Linux kernel. So we just had to basically enable them in the device tree, and that was about it. So it really shows that reusing drivers actually works. So we had 99 patches uh, going into 3.8, which isn't released yet, but should be soon. And for 3.9, we'll be adding some more things. Um, RTC, USB, SDIO support, but here it's also pretty easy. We already have the drivers inside the kernel. The hardware units are the same than previous version of the SOC, so we just reuse the drivers as is with almost zero change. We added RQ Affinity support, so it's kind of um, nice when you do SMP. Local timer support, it's also SMP related. And we're hoping to bring PCI uh, support as well. So hopefully this is going to be in 3.9. I don't know, it should be going 30, 50, maybe between 20 and 40 patches, depending on how many things we can, we can merge. So in basically four versions of the kernel, we managed to push quite a lot of features to support those, um, those new SOCs, uh, which is nice. Um, I have one minute left. So my few recommendations into getting an ARM SOC in mainline, throw away vendor BSP code, code it's crap. Um, it's, usually not, does not use the device tree, does not use any of those uh, infrastructure that's set up by the kernel. So Marvel does have a BSP. We haven't ever, ever looked into the code for this BSP. It's almost useless. Uh, start small. Uh, they have some communities, for example, around the all-winner A10, A13 SOCs that have been doing a lot of Linux work um, on their side without submitting anything. And they kind of apparently were waiting for everything to be ready before submitting. But then at this point, you realize that you did something wrong, you used the wrong interface, and you have to redo a lot of work. So start small, submit early. Um, comply with the latest infrastructure changes. I think I described some of them. Um, reading and posting to the Linux ARM kernel mailing list is mandatory. You have to follow that almost on a daily basis to keep track of what are the latest infrastructure changes, the, the good practices. Um, listen to review and comments, be patient and um, persistent in, in retrying, and look at the recently merged sub-architectures. There is really a wide range of sub-architectures in the ARM kernel, and not all of them are up to date with all those changes. So pick the right ones. So I've mentioned a few of them here, but look at which architectures are really active and, and up to date before taking some code as an example. So. You remember in March 2011, Linus said that's a mm, pain in the ass, this ARM stuff. And um, more recently, in August 2012, he said in, over the last year, ARM has gone from a constant headache every merge window to an outstanding citizen in the Linux community. So it sounds like his opinion uh, has changed quite a bit in uh, just a year and a half, which is, uh, which is nice. Questions? Yes? Okay, so the question is, I said, for, with the pin control thing, you can describe uh, the pin boxing in the device tree, uh, which means, uh, does that mean it's a compile time only and can, can be changed at, at runtime? So it can, to some extent, be changed at runtime. For example, there are some SOCs that need you to change the pin boxing when you go into suspend and then when you resume, things like that. So there, are, there is some uh, mechanism to do uh, runtime changes of the state of each pin. But as far as my understanding of the pin control system goes, there isn't really a support for completely changing the mixing at, at runtime, like switching um, from using an SPI controller on those pins to using something completely different. It's not 
maybe some people are trying to work on this, but it's, it's not really part of the, the initial design and usage of it. So it's, it's ma mainly static. Some other questions? Yes, please. How do they relate to GPL? So at the moment, the device tree files are part of the kernel sources in Arch, R, Boot, DTS, uh, at least the ones that people want to submit. So those ones are um, licen uh, uh, licensed under the GPL. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with a device tree that will be outside the kernel and shipped as binary only. I'm not exactly sure what's the licensing status. I'm pretty sure it's going to, to be raising a number of uh, issues and questions uh, about what's the, their licensing or vendors providing a binary only version of a device tree. But it's, having, having a binary version only of, of a device tree is not too much of a problem because it's the text version and the binary version are, are kind of close together. So it's not like source code and, 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 and compiled code where it's very hard from compiled code to get back to source code. Here it's, it's pretty close. So it will not be that big of an issue, a practical issue, but there will certainly be some licensing questions yet, but I, I don't have the, the answer. Uh, 